Hawthorne stands at the forefront of our fiction writers in the 19th century. He documented the story of our first earliest settlers, the Puritans, as they settled in New England. This was his fascination, and he portrayed life in Puritan New England very faithfully. Uh, he also got to the, the bottom line, if you will, of life in New England, and really and the, the legacy for all of us, because he dealt with the most fundamental themes of good versus evil. Of course, this was a big topic for Puritans, um, and books like The Scarlet Letter, uh, short stories like The Birthmark, The Minister's Black Veil, speak to the, the fundamental areas of, of good and evil that really have a lot to say to all of us now. Help us understand his popularity when he was writing. I think he was fairly popular. He was well known. He was one of the foremost of the New England authors. And New England was really the center of American literature in the 19th century. Um, other authors were considered regional authors. So New England really was the center. And he was quite well known. He traveled in the same circles as Thoreau, Emerson, uh, Louisa May Alcott, John Greenleaf Whittier, Longfellow, um, the, whole, the whole group. To what extent were the Puritan themes that he wrote about popular among some of these other authors that you've mentioned? Hawthorne is really the one who exploited them to the, the, to the greatest degree. The others dealt with other, other themes, but Hawthorne is the one who, who focused on the Puritan life. The library has some of his original work. You've brought one of his books. Yes. We have a, a curious manuscript. Uh, at the end of his life, in the last two years, he wrote something called Dr. Grimshaw's Secret. And what the library has is an, uh, an early outline and draft, um, actually acquired from two separate sources, and the pages joined together in the early 1920s. Um, Hawthorne started working on this in 1862. And it went through many, many versions, revisions, drafts, sketches, outlines, and was still unfinished at the time of his death in 1864. Um, it was edited posthumously by his son, Julian Hawthorne. But it's a story of Dr. Grimshaw, who is in, in America, has emigrated, his ancestors emigrated from England, and he has a secret. He goes back to England to see what's going on with this secret, uh, and the novel plays out from there. But. Hawthorne explored many, many different ways of pursuing the story of Dr. Grimshaw. Um, it's a little bit different from most of Hawthorne's works because it doesn't deal overtly and directly and primarily with the theme of good and evil, but that does play into it. Where does it uh, uh, lay out in terms of a timeline compared to The Scarlet Letter, for instance? The Scarlet Letter was in 1850 and Dr. Grimshaw's Secret comes 12 years later, 1862. So it's a late novel for Hawthorne. When looking at the outline, uh, if you were someone who came into the library, what types of things would you be able to see in it? What you would see in this autograph manuscript, first of all, is Hawthorne's handwriting, which is quite small and a little bit difficult to read for us now. But you would also see that it's very smoothly written. Hawthorne makes very few corrections. And I find this especially remarkable in a work that underwent so many re revisions and alterations and different um, lifetimes, in a sense. It became one kind of novel, and then it became another kind of novel. But at least in this draft and sketch, his, idea, his ideas are full-blown, and they simply flow off his pen very, very smoothly and rapidly. How did the library come to be in possession of this document? Well. We got it in two groups of pages. We got some pages uh, at auction in 1922 from the Anderson Galleries, and we have some other pages that were acquired from William K. Bixby in 1916. He was a private collector, much as Henry Huntington was. We'll come back and talk about Mr. Bixby. You also have some personal letters, correct? Yes. Nathaniel Hawthorne's letters to his wife, Sophia, we have several dozen of these letters, and they're, they're very, very touching letters. They're very affectionate, very loving, um, almost more so than a lot of letters in the 19th century, which was a time of restraint, emotional restraint, in correspondence at least, and between husbands and wives. So you, you often, in letters between spouses, you get a very formal tone almost distant, and it simply is the way of the time. But for Hawthorne, there's, there's much more um, affection that's revealed, much more closeness emotionally. 
And the interesting thing about these letters is that Sophia, after Nathaniel's death, um, marked out certain passages. She overscored them quite heavily so that one can't read what's under them. And various efforts have been made, and some scholars feel they've gotten either most of the words, all of the world, words, or just a few. But we can't be absolutely sure what's under the overscoring. Interestingly, Hawthorne burned all of Sophia's letters to him in 1853. So clearly we have a sense of people who valued their privacy, did not want people seeing their innermost loving thoughts to each other. But it's, it's interesting to speculate what he would have said. Um, I can read the section beginning just before the, the overscored lines and then continuing beyond. How did I live before I knew you, before I possessed your affection? I reckon upon your love as something that is to endure when everything that can perish has perished. Though my trust is sometimes mingled with fear because I feel myself unworthy of your love. But if I am worthy of it, you will always love me. And if there be anything good and pure in me, it will be proved by my always loving you. The passage that you just read sounds romantic in nature. What is she blacking out? You had talked about some of what's blacked out is our romantic passages. Yes. I, I don't know. It's hard to speculate. Uh, Certainly, even with such an affectionate and loving tone, it would not have been anything at all shocking to us now. Um, it's hard to speculate what she would have left out. Possibly something that was just a little bit more personal than that, even, talking about uh, their personal relationship or personal failings on his part. How many letters did you mention that the library has? We have several dozen. And are there these marks within all of the letters? Nearly all, yes. Were most of the letters that he wrote to his wife romantic in nature? Yes. Judging from his writings in his books, is it surprising to you to see this type of writing? That's hard to say. Um, in a sense, not really, because he writes about human emotions and the good and evil that are within each of us. Um, certainly the Scarlet Ladder, which is probably the bane of every school student in America, but is a, is a wonderful, beautifully written book. Um, speaks of the most inner, uh, of the innermost feelings of the, the characters involved in them. And it, it speaks of the harm that can be done when love is perverted. Approximately what time span are we talking about for these personal letters? We're talking about the late 1830s on through to the early 1860s. The condition of the letter looks as if it's in rather good, very nice condition. It's in very good condition. How has it been, do you know how it's been so well preserved over the years? Well, I don't know how it has been preserved until we got it. Um, it must have stayed within the family. When we got these letters many decades ago, we have stored them in climate-controlled vaults in acid-free folders to keep, keep them as purely as we can. The last piece that you've brought is an essay on the life of Franklin Pierce, President Franklin Pierce. Can yes. you talk about that? Yes. Hawthorne and Pierce were fellow students at Bowdoin College in Maine, and they were very good friends. So in 1852, Hawthorne set out to write A Life of Franklin Pierce. And this is a manuscript of part of the draft of that biography. It's in a, a finely bound volume that came from the library of William K. Bixby, that collector we've already mentioned. And it is placed in this volume in what we call window mountings, which means there's a, like a window frame of larger paper with each leaf placed within that frame. Um, again, Hawthorne and Pierce enjoyed a very close friendship throughout their lives. Um, a decade after this biography was written, Hawthorne, in fact, uh, suffered a good deal of, of negative public opinion because by then, Pierce, who was a northerner but a sympathizer with the South during the Civil War, um, was widely disliked among the abolitionists in New England. And Hawthorne, in writing his own memoirs called Our Old Home, wrote a letter of dedication dedicating that book to Franklin Pierce. And Hawthorne took a good deal of negative publicity for having done this because he lived among the abolitionists and he himself did not favor slavery. I was going to ask, in his writings, do Hawthorne's politics come out? 
Not so much in what I've read, at least. Um, he really more talks about the human condition in human relationships. You mentioned that they went to school together. If, what's the nature of their relationship? What would have attracted these two people to one another through the years? Probably just shared outlook on some things, um, enjoyment of reading together, reading the, and enjoying the same literature, enjoying politics together. Uh, I think they had a wide-ranging friendship. Did one or the other benefit from the other's success and fame? I think, I think they benefited from each other until the point where Hawthorne dedicated that book to Pierce. And then they, they, by then, Pierce was very unpopular. And Hawthorne then began to share that unpopularity. Talk a little bit more about the pre presentation that you mentioned. You called it a window mounting. Why is it done in that fashion? It's done in this way to preserve each page and to make it uh, capable of being bound. This is something that, that private collectors have often done with manuscripts that they acquire. Because to do a window mounting and to bind something, you can put it in a very handsome Morocco binding with wonderful decorations, with very attractive marbled end papers with one's book plate in it. So presentation is an important part of this, especially for private collectors. And you mentioned this piece came from the private collection at one time of William Bixby. Yes. Talk a little bit about who he was. I don't know what he did uh, to make his money, but he was one of the major collectors in the early part of the 20th century. He and Henry Huntington and other collectors who had large libraries would um, just about trade things among themselves. If they had duplicates in their libraries, they would put these items up for auction. And typically, one of them would buy items from the other's library. So it was almost like uh, a circulation of sorts. But we have hundreds of items that Henry Huntington bought from Bixby's library. From your role with the library, how often do you see scholars come in to look at works from writers such as Nathaniel Hawthorne? Daily, daily. What are, their, what are they doing? What type of research? Scholars are doing research for biographies, for critical studies, for interpretive works, for social history. Uh, we get every point of view, every purpose for research. We're open for advanced scholarly research for people who are doing original research for which they need to have access to the original manuscripts and to rare printed books. And we really entertain scholars from literally all over the world who come from across the street or the other side of the, of the, the globe to look at the unique treasures that we have here that they cannot get anywhere else. And this allows the scholars to further what we know about our heritage 